Hello, BookTube. I have another starter kit for you today. Uh, for those of you who are new to my channel, these are videos where I give you a sort of a, a quick beginner overview of books that you can try that I hope are of interest on a certain subject or a certain author, a certain heading, whatever it is. Uh, people tend to like them. They, they instantly generate uh, some reading lists, which is good. That's, that's just what I want. And today's starter kit is blasphemous. <laughs> Pure blasphemy. Uh, because it's a Dante starter kit. And the reason that's blasphemy is because, of course, BookTube has a Dante expert, and that is Tom at Tom L.A. Books, who is doing an epic, canto-by-canto canto read-through of the Divine Comedy. And that if you're missing it, you shouldn't. It's the, some of the best that BookTube has to offer. If you're missing it, you shouldn't miss it. He's in Paradiso now, but you can go all the way back to the very beginning, to the very first canto of the Inferno, and start there. You'll never have a better guide uh, through Dante than Tom. The only, and, and so that highlights, you know, the, the gall, the temerity, the unmitigated chutzpah <laughs> that would cause me to make a Dante starter kit of my own. And I have only a few justifications for this. Number one, it's Dante Day, which Tom himself killed me into. Uh, this is the day that is celebrated as Dante Day in Italy because it's Dante's birthday? No, no. Because it's Dante's death day? No, no. It's Because this is the day that most Italian scholars think is probably the day that Dante started his visit to the Inferno, that he started his great journey midway in life's voyage. And the reason why the Italians pick that for Dante Day instead of any normal commemorative date is because when it comes to Dante, they're all a little bit weird. <laughs> That's justification number one. Justification number two that I'm giving for a Dante starter kit, even though I'm not Tom, is that Tom's walk through verse by verse, line by line, sometimes word choice by word choice, in the Divine Comedy is not really starters. It's a great place to go if you've never read Dante, but maybe it would never occur to Tom to descend, to stopper his knowledge of Dante down so low as to make a starter kit. And my third justification, my most immediate personal justification, is that although Tom is our indisputable Dante expert, my greatest justification for making a Dante starter kit is that I have been reading Dante and loving Dante longer than Tom. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Let's just be gentle and say I've been doing it longer than he has. I, long before he had ever heard of Dante. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I had, I had already fallen in love with this poet. That's my justification. I will beg his indulgence on Voxer at the next chance that I get. So we're going to do a few books here. And unlike my previous starter kit, I had several gentle reminders from some of you that if I have all these iPads, I could show you visuals in addition, to, in addition to just droning. So I've arranged my visuals sooner or later. As I always say, sooner or later, I've got the hang of this booktube thing. Uh, I've got a few books that I want to show you for a Dante starter kit. And with many authors, when I'm making a starter kit, the first thing that I would do would be to say, well, biographies and commentary are one thing. Sure, they're great. But the thing to do is to read the author first, right? If if I were making a, a starter kit for Nathaniel Hawthorne, I guarantee you, I would say, well, go and read the books, <laughs> you know, read the books, then maybe branch out to reading the letters, then maybe biographies or critical studies. But the very first thing you have to do, it's the ultimate example of putting the cart before the horse to read a critical study of an author before you've read the author. But I'm not saying that with Dante. Because I'm going to recommend you all kinds of things in English here. And Dante wrote his masterpiece, the Commedia, is extremely abstruse. That's why you need a guide like Tom to walk you through it line by line, canto by canto, because it is not at all straightforward, not in the slightest. There are major historical and philosophical and theological characters or concepts that are only alluded to in the actual text. Dante only bothers to allude to them, not because he's trying to be difficult, like, for instance, his countryman, Umberto Eco, but because he assumed that his readers would know those things. How many times in Dante is Aristotle not named when he is being talked about? <laughs> How many times are even Dante's countrymen, historical figures, 
not being named. How many illusions are there that you need a guide to catch? That is that su suffuses Dante's writings. Which means he's a rare example of an author where I would say read about the author quite a bit before you try to read the author. Now, I would have made that proclamation a lot more strongly uh, before there was Tom's video series. And you all had a ubiquitous means of playing that video series. You have a phone on your person at all times. You could watch his videos right now. You could, you could, they are immediately accessible to you and they break down the Divine Comedy. And when we're talking about Dante, he wrote, we have, you know, other stuff from his pen, but we're talking about the Divine Comedy. And that means that a starter kit has to start with studies of the man, his time, and his work. And hope, you have to hope that the writer of those studies is aware of the fact that you won't know the work at your fingertips. So that these become great introductions to the whole of Dante's thinking, to the whole of his time, and the presuppositions of all of those those allusions and call-outs in the Divine Comedy. So we're going to start our starter kit with those. Instead of starting with anything else, we're going to start with studies of Dante. I've got them on the iPad here, and the first one that I want to show you is, uh, it has a terrible American cover and a terrible Americanized title that tries to explain everything to the readers that the publisher assumes are dumb. Uh, so I went with the IB Taurus cover from the UK, which I, if I saw this at the Brattleboard shop or anywhere else, I would grab it in a heartbeat. This is Dante by Barbara Reynolds, uh, who was a, a great Dante scholar and also uh, a, a staff and support to a great many other Dante scholars and a great many scholars of all kinds. She's also a prolific translator, uh, and her study of Dante is just what you want just the kind of a book that you want to start off showing you everything, taking you through the basics. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. Now the problem here is that I don't have, I don't have all the categories together uh, on this iPad. So I will bounce around a little uh, like for instance, uh, Barbara Reynolds book is also, also serves as a biography. It's not hard to write a biography of Dante. There's a maddeningly little that we, there's a lot more that we would like to know about him than we actually do know. Uh, so this next one is, a biography, and this is an English language translation by Dixon. I think the translator's last name is Dixon. The translator is not mentioned on the cover. But the cover is such a graceful thing that in this particular case, I don't mind. This is one of the first books that we ever hauled on this channel. Uh, five years ago, uh, I hauled this book on this channel. This is by Marco Santaga, Santagata, and it's Dante, the story of his life. Some of you may remember this. I got this trade paperback. I got the hardcover before I had the channel, but I got the trade paperback after I'd started making videos. A long time ago, when this couch was in a different part of the room and when I had two sweet old dogs on either side of me. instead. But this is really, really good, even in English. I'm only going to recommend things in English. Uh, and when it comes to a study of Dante's world and all of his historical antecedents, whatever we know about it, and the groundings of the work, uh, the, the poetry. I, in addition to recommending Barbara Reynolds and in addition to recommending uh, Santagata, I also want to recommend a Dante scholar from a previous generation. In case some of you like that, right, there's a different writing feel to literary or historical subjects from a generation ago. They tend to be bigger. Uh, they tend to feel a little bit more assured they were working at a time, the, these, these authors were working at a time when the canon was not in question. And that adds a flavor that they weren't conscious of. They weren't trying to do it. It never occurred to them that the, the canon would ever not be in favor. Some of you have told me over the years that you like some of those older biographies as well. And there's a great one from oh, 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. It's by Thomas Caldecott Chubb, and it's called Dante and His World. If you can find a used copy of this, it's it's got a, it's a blue dust jacket in the American edition. If you can find a, a copy of this, it's well well worth your time. It is every it's the same as the Santagata or the Barbara Reynolds. It's meant to be a complete comprehensive look at all the stuff about Dante, his his history, and also what went into his poetry. It but it's written with the. Uh, the center, the sentiment of uh, a different era. 
And then we'll, to move back to the present, another thing that you might want to do, another kind of book that you might want to work in on a starter kit would be people who aren't necessarily writing a biography of Dante, although that doesn't take much time to do. Like I mentioned, you can, you can write out the, the basics of what we know about Dante in comparatively little space. Uh, he shares that distinction with, for instance, Shakespeare. Uh, so another kind of book that you want on your starter kit is not so much a biography and a life and times like we've seen in the first three, but a guide to reading Dante, what it's like to read him with allusions to his biography when necessary, but really what it's like to experience the work. And believe it or not, I am recommending that you maybe try one of those books before you try reading the book. Anything that will demystify the Divine Comedy for you so that when you read it, you don't stop is fine by me. Any, any amount of that reading that you can do ahead of time is fine by me. So I have another one to recommend along those lines. This is Reading Dante by Prue Shaw, uh, which I thought was uh, very, very good. It's much shorter than any of the other books that I've mentioned so far, and it's very conversational. I mean, it's scholarly. The author obviously knows Dante really well, but it's, it's conversational in a way uh, that would never have occurred to, for instance, uh, the writer of that previous biography to Chubb. That would, it would never have occurred to him to address an, a reading audience this way. That's just a 21st century thing. There's no way uh, really to get around that. Uh, then, uh, in addition to biographical studies and literary studies to demystify Dante, because one of the, one of the big challenges that I have always faced when trying to, uh, to proselytize for Dante, trying to convince people to give him a try, which I've been doing for a very long time. One of the obstacles that I always face is that element of intimidation. This is the Divine Comedy, and it's it's steep writing. It's gorgeous. Just watch one of Tom's videos if you don't believe me. The verse is gorgeous, and there have been English language translations that manage to capture some of that or another, aspects, shards of that. But one of the key uh, uphill battles for Dante is to eliminate that element of intimidation. And I have found that one of the key ways to do that is uh, to get him off the reading pedestal and carry him around with you so that he is more familiar to you. And fortunately, I am that, that desire to get these authors off their pedestals and get them carried around with you was also the desire of the editors of the Viking Portable Library series 50 years, 60 years ago when they came out with a wonderful library of authors and subject matters. Wonderful little hardcovers that aren't made anymore. I'm pretty sure that Penguin still makes a portable Dante, but it's a beautiful Black Spine Penguin classic trade paperback. It might not be the kind of thing that you want to batter or to carry around with you so that you don't feel intimidated at all by it. So I wanted to recommend an earlier, the earlier Viking Portable Library uh, edition of Dante, which has basically everything that Dante wrote. And uh, the Divine Comedy is here in its entirety by, in, in a translation by Lawrence Binion, uh, who was a really good scholar, a very good poet, a uh, World War I poet, or a, world, a poet who was horrified by World War I. Probably some of you will know his poem, For the Fallen. Uh, and he brings not only that poetic sensibility to Dante, which is something, that is absolutely something. Every translator bring you hope, every translator, every good translator of Dante will bring to his work something that they need for Dante. And we're going to see when we talk about translations, there are a whole bunch of different things. The idea that you will get a translator who has all of those things is a little bit outlandish. It's, it hasn't happened as far as I know. What Binion brings to Dante is two things. Uh, a knowledge of viscera. And I don't mean just in the literal sense, a knowledge of war, a knowledge of horror, which Dante very much had, and which shows everywhere, but especially in the Inferno. Uh, and also Binion brings a poetic sensibility, which is very important to do. It's kind of amazing to me how many people have translated the Divine Comedy without being themselves poets. Uh, I think it adds a lot to the, to the endeavor uh, to have that kind of an ear, if you can if you can do it. So the Binion translation, I don't know that it's in print anymore in any way, but it's well worth being in this, but everything else is in this volume too, with a good quick introduction and all. Uh, and since we're talking about translations, uh, let's move on 
to talk about the different translations, some different translations. I talked about some of them in my uh, Daily Penguin when we talked about Dante, uh, but I, wanted, I want to recommend some others too. And like I mentioned, any translator is going to bring only a set number of things to Dante. Uh, Dante had all the things <laughs> because he was a towering genius. But a translator, first you've got to have the skill with the language, which not everybody has. And then once you do, well, that eliminates a vast field of candidates. But once you do have the skill with the language, Dante is not entirely easy to translate. Once you do have the skill with the language, then you have to have certain skills of your own in your own language. <laughs> and uh, not all Dante uh, translators do, and it varies depending on what you want in the English. So I want to preface my discussion of, of for the starter kit of various Dante translations with the same thing I always say about any work in translation, which is that it's going to come down to you, not anybody else. It's not going to come down to scholarly acumen. You want to enjoy this thing, right? So what you need to do is find out which translator works best for you, even if it's a bad one, <laughs> even if it's a bad translator, uh, the translator is, is still opening the door to you. If you don't know the original language, the translator is still opening the door. They can do a, a bad job of it. They can let it slip and slam in your face. They can stub your toe with it, but at least they're opening the door for you. So, I, I mean, for instance, uh, legendarily, the, the Butcher and Lang translation of Homer is legendarily awful, and yet... It's free, and it has been the doorway for, to Homer for many, many people that I have known over the years. Many, many people. And they, those people go on to see the shortcomings in that translation and pick other translations. But that doesn't matter at the beginning. The, the technical merits of the translation don't matter at the beginning, because we have shifted now in this starter kit to you reading Dante. And what matters there, the only thing that matters there at the beginning, is do you get along with the translator? The translator's right there. They're the most important person. If they're not working for you, then you need to find a translator who does. Uh, so my advice is always, you know, go to your library or your bookstore or wherever and pull as many translations of the same thing off the shelf as you can, sit down at a butcher block table or an easy chair, and just read right alongside each other until you find the one you like. Uh, but I wanted to recommend a few translations just, just in general. Uh, keeping in mind here that it's with Dante, it's a twofold thing. It's not just the translation. It's also the annotation. Uh, because even once you've read all those biographies, and all those critical studies and whatnot, you're still going to need the translator to be providing you with information on the page about what the heck you're reading. <laughs> that's, that's how abstruse and buried in illusions uh, the Divine Comedy is. So a really good edition of Dante will have a great translation and great notes. Often, depending on which translation you end up liking, often you will have to sacrifice the one for the other. Uh, but we'll see what we can do here. Now, of course, me being me, uh, the first translation that I want to mention is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, where, which is an example from the 19th century of a poet like Binion bringing a poet's sentimentality, a, a poet's perception of the world, to the translation of another poet. That can be a very tricky thing. I myself think that Longfellow succeeds incredibly. I think his, his Dante is amazingly good. Uh, and I wanted to show you the cover that you simply must have. <laughs> you can see it's translated by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, but it, <laughs> that is Dante. <laughs> this is from the video game. For a brief, for a brief shining moment, the publisher, some publisher, had the inspired idea to put the video game cover on the Longfellow translation of the Inferno. Uh, so this is, of course, the Inferno to have. You'll be the coolest bookworm on the bus when you're reading this thing. When you tell people, "Well, I'm, I'm, I've got a book," and they say, "Oh, you in a book? You always got your nose in a book. What are you reading? What are you reading this time?" And you say, "I'm reading Dante's Divine Comedy," and they say, "Oh my God, that sounds so dull." And then you pull this out. <laughs> so I wanted to, to mention that one. Uh, but there are a couple of other translations that I want to mention. Like, for instance, uh, speaking of Barbara Reynolds, let's talk about uh, Dorothy Sayers, the author of the Lord Peter Whimsey Harriet Vane murder mysteries that are so good. They're so enjoyable. Uh, uh, Dorothy Sayers was also a Dante scholar and a rigorous, very energetic one. And for Penguin Classic, she did... Uh, 
hell, purgatory, and heaven. She did not uh, Italianize the names. She just did hell, purgatory, and heaven. And it's her translation, which I have heard people quibble about. I really like it. I, I, uh, I know what I don't like when it comes to a Dante translation. There are plenty that I don't like. I don't like Mark Musa's translation. I think it's tone deaf. I don't like the most popular English language translation of Dante of them all, which is John Chiardi. I never, I don't see any worth in it at all. Uh, I think there's worth in Dorothy Sayers' translation of Dante, but oh my God, her notes are unbelievable. They are unbelievable. The sheer amount of critical apparatus support that you get in these three humble penguin trade paperbacks or mass markets is astonishing. I have often said that, that Penguin should make a big, fat Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition of the Dorothy Sayers translation of Dante. That is a remarkable thing for a best-selling murder mystery author to do a really good, critically respected, critical edition of Dante and run in Penguin Classic's popular paperback series. That's literary history. Name another time <laughs> when when that happens. That's like that's like uh, Simenon doing a, a critically respected translation of Rabelais. It doesn't happen. Penguin owns that, and it's a part of their literary history. It should be a big, beautiful Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. But you can certainly find these, the Dorothy Sayers Penguin, uh, Dante, and I, I recommend that you do. Uh, then I, of course, want to recommend uh, my favorite of the modern translators is Alan Mandelbaum. And this is an Everyman's Library, one, one volume of his three. You can also get his three... I'm sure online you could find used copies. They were in mass market paperback forever and ever. They were all over schools. Uh, there was a, we saw just the other day on my library tour, three big illustrated hardcovers. I uh, believe that the Everyman Library edition here does not have the illustrations. I think they got rid of the, uh, uh, the Moser illustrations for this and just have the translation and the notes. But the translation and the notes are really, really good. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted, of course, to to sing the praises of uh, of Alan Mandelbaum's translation. Uh, but the volume, if we're going with my favorite translation, and if we're going with presentation, which can matter as well, I also wanted very much for the starter kit to recommend the Barnes and Noble leatherbound edition of the Divine Comedy, which is a beautiful thing in deep, deep uh, burgundy red. Uh, uh, just a you know the faux leather with the the a uh, really tough binding and uh, just a a lovely lovely presentation and also uh the Gustav Dory illustrations for the divine comedy not just one or two but all of them just like the Barnes and Noble leather bound King James Bible has all of the Dory illustrations uh and so I wanted I, I wanted to recommend this I'm not sure that you wouldn't be better off with either Dorothy Sayers translation or Alan Mandelbaum's uh, but you could put this in the back of your mind in case you want to return to the 19th century to Longfellow for a different translation once you feel like you, you're looking for that kind of variety. Uh, and we'll finish up here with a, a little treat uh, that is also out of print, it's, but it's something that I feel certain you could find. Uh, okay. Uh, and I couldn't not mention it. This is from Dover. The, old, the publisher Dover used to make a great line of books. Nowadays, they're known for cheap reprints. If you go looking online for a really cheap copy of Oliver Twist or something like that, one of the cheapest will be Dover. But once upon a time, they had all sorts of enterprising stuff in their list. It was kind of amazing. Finding older Dovers from 50 years ago in used bookstores will astound you. And one of the things that they did, one of their editors at the time was a great fan of the illustrator Gustav Dore. So am I, <laughs> very much so. And that editor brought out, for Dover, brought out a whole run of Dore collections. There's a big oversized volume of, full of his, his illustrations of the Bible. Uh, there's one for Orlando Furioso. There's one for a great many, a great many. And there's one for the Divine Comedy. Uh, that I, I had to, to, to finish up this starter kit by recommending it. If you can find this old trade paperback, uh, it, it really helps to see Dore did these things uh, larger than room size. 
his, these engravings were absolutely enormous when he did them. So really, they benefit the bigger you can get them. And this is slightly bigger than the engravings that you will see in the Barnes & Noble Leatherbound Edition. And this is all of them with the appropriate verse. Uh, they're very different from the Moser illustrations. They're very different from any other. They're far more uh, literal, uh, which can sometimes help. There's, there's Dante and Virgil there on the cover just in case you're wondering who that guy is who's caressing Dante uh, that's Virgil uh, and uh, sometimes a literal interpretation a black and white engraved interpretation can help because some of Dante's descriptions of what uh, what he's seeing in this poem aren't particularly clear there are some descriptions even in the Inferno which is very explicit there are some descriptions that still have scholars wondering well what exactly is he talking about here what is he seeing uh, but anyway, that is a Dante starter kit for Dante Day. I'm going to beg apostolic forgiveness from Tom at Tom L.A. Books, but I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist for Dante Day giving you a Dante starter kit. Uh, but I, I want to reiterate that the main part of the starter kit has nothing to do with an individual book or a collection of books. It is, you should try Dante, and the best way to do that is to de-intimidate yourself first. Well, whatever means that you have to do. There's always Wikipedia. There are breakdowns everywhere. And there's also uh, Tom's series. The best possible way that I can think of to read The Divine Comedy, which is what I centered on here, I would also strongly recommend Barbara Reynolds' translation of La Vida Nuova for Penguin Classics. I'm pretty sure they still print it. Uh, but I, I centered on the Divine Comedy because that's the Everest here that we're talking about. That's the, the towering work by this author. And another great way to de-intimidate yourself about the Divine Comedy would be to get the Divine Comedy English language translation that you find you like, whichever translator works best for you. Get that translation and then follow along with Tom's videos. Don't try it any other way. Read it. Read a canto, then watch his video. Read the next one watch the video. <laughs> but uh, but I had to put in my two cents in for Dante Day, so I will I will wrap this up for now and go beg forgiveness. But I will be back. Thank you, Booktube.